Section 2.5.3, the electric field on a conductor and the force on a surface charge. So just outside, and we, we really have to be very careful here. So we have like um, some surface and we've approximated that with some very tiny patch of that surface, which has a surface charge density of sigma. Okay. And then we basically have three electric fields that we're thinking about, right? One is the E on the outside, the E vector on the inside, and the E vector at the surface, okay? Um, so we know that outside the surface, because of this surface charge, the electric field um, has to be perpendicular. Um, if, it was, if there was any parallel component, then the surface charge would move on the conductor's surface, and so we'd be left with something else. So the E vector outside is equal to that surface charge divided by epsilon naught in the normal direction. Okay. Um, in terms of potential, then you know basically we have um, minus grad v. Ah, I'm doing this wrong. Is equal to the electric field. That's there's no dot there. It's just grad v. Okay. Um, minus grad v equals the electric field. So that means minus the grad V. So we have D V along the N direction is equal to minus the charge over epsilon naught. Okay. This is a, these are two important equations that you're probably wanting to remember. Okay. So we know, we know what the, we know what the potential is, how it's changing along that surface. Um, so if you know the potential at the surface or the electric field immediately outside the surface, you can easily calculate what the surface charge is at the surface. The next bit is um, what is the force on that surface charge? And the part that's going to blow your mind here and confuse you is that we, we can't have you lifting up a bucket by pulling on the handle and standing in it or standing in it and pulling on the handle. So we have to exclude the force due to the surface, the electric field due to the surface charge and focus only on the electric field that's coming from the outside. Okay. But we don't want the electric field immediately outside, we want the electric field at the surface. Okay. So the force on a surface charge, we're going to write this as curly F equals the surface charge density times the electric field. Okay. Um, at the surface. Okay, and this is not the total force. This is the force per surface per unit surface area, because this is the charge per unit surface. So this is the force per unit area. Um, so remember this pillbox argument that we had, and I'm going to really quickly summarize that for you, just to remind yourself. So we have uh, some surface, and what we do, some surface charge, and what we do is we draw this Gaussian surface that's like a box and extends below, okay? And what we discovered is if we squish this box down so it's almost touching the surface, then the um, electric field, the, the, the parallel, com the perpendicular components to the box, so the sides of that box, the electric field is zero, right? Um, the, the flux there is zero um, because if we had some outside electric field coming into the surface charge, then it would cancel out um, you know, it'd be the same coming inside and outside, top, bottom's pretty much the same at the surface. But due to the charge, we have an electric field that comes from the charge pointing up and an electric field from the charge pointing down. So um, the total electric field just above the surface and the total electric field just below the surface is going to be this. So the electric field just above is going to be whatever electric field is coming from the outside plus sigma over 2 epsilon naught that's the surface charge over there epsilon and the electric field immediately below has to be E outside plus or minus sigma over 2 epsilon naught in the same direction okay so um, we know that when we cross that surface that the 
electric field has to flip in the normal hat direction by a quantity of sigma over epsilon naught. That has to happen in order to make this Gaussian surface work. Um, the next part of my reasoning is, I'm going really slowly and carefully here because uh, the reading, he, he kind of leaves a lot to your imagination. And so I'm trying to fill in the blanks here that he left out. So um, if we want to extract, so given the electric field above and below, we want to extract this outside field. Okay, so what we can do is we can rewrite these equations. So we say basically the E vector outside is equal to the E vector of the above minus sigma over two epsilon naught n hat and I'm, yes, that's correct. It's also equal to E vector of the below plus sigma over two epsilon naught in the n hat direction. So basically what I've done is I've just subtracted and put it over there and added it and put it over there. So we get E outside is equal to this, okay? Now, how can we eliminate these two elements? Well, we can just add them and divide by two. So this is equal to one half of the sum of these, right? So it's one half of E vector above plus E vector below. And these two terms cancel each other out, okay? So the electric field, not caused by the surface charge, but coming from the outside through that surface charge or at that surface charge is equal to one half of the electric fields above and below, okay? So for a conductor, the electric surface below or on the inside is going to be zero. And the electric field just above is going to be sigma over two epsilon naught in the n hat direction. Okay. Sigma over epsilon naught, I'm sorry, epsilon naught. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sigma over epsilon naught in the n hat direction. Um, so we get the electric field caused by the outside of simply one half uh, sigma over epsilon naught n hat, okay? That's the electric field caused from the outside stuff happening. And that's the, that's the electric field this charge can actually interact with it. It's not gonna put a force on itself. So now we can calculate the force of the electric field at that point, okay? And that is going to be equal to um, the surface charge times this, one half sigma over epsilon naught in the normal direction. So it's just one half sigma squared over epsilon naught in the n hat direction, okay? And we can rewrite this in terms of the electric field that that surface is experiencing uh, right then and there. So the electric field is one half epsilon naught. So if we had square that one quarter sigma squared over epsilon naught squared, so we need basically, hold on, I'm not doing this right, am I? Oh, the E outside, the E outside is sigma this. So if we express it according to the electric field just outside, take that and square it, we get, um, okay. Um, I'm sorry, this is the E kind of at. I don't want to get these two confused, okay? So this is the E at that area, and this is the E outside, that's immediately outside there, okay? So this is E squared of the outside, okay, which gives us sigma over epsilon not squared, it's gonna be in the hat direction. And then so we want this to be equal to this, so we need an epsilon not on the top, and we need a two on the bottom, okay? And um, basically also, um, how much pressure is being applied um, because of that electric field on the outside, well, the pressure is just gonna be the magnitude of that without the direction. So let me circle the important equations so that you remember them. Okay, so this one, this one, um, this one, this one, and this one. These are all important equations that you may find useful at some point. Let me just kind of fill in the right-hand sides here. Um, this is force per unit area, of course, and this is the E at, okay, that part. And I don't think there's much more to say on this. Take your time with this, this section, read the book, what he's talking about, correlate with what I'm talking about, and understand why, well, you know, to be honest, his introduction of the average is kind of a fluke, 
but uh, I mean, it's it's it happens to be the average, but I think it's better to explain it this way. So hope you like my way better. Thanks. Bye.